Hi, this is Brennan Davis from Bedrock Games and the Bedrock Blog, and I'm here with Adam Balderstone for an episode of Bedrock and Balderstone, where we're going to be continuing our discussion of I, Claudius, the television series. Uh, we just did uh, episodes 1A and B. That was A Touch of Murder and Family Affairs. So today we're going to be talking about episode 2, Waiting in the Wings. I should point out, depending on which version you happen to have, you, this could be uh, episode 3 because... Uh, in in the Acorn version, and I think the original version that aired on BBC, uh, the first two episodes were sort of treated as a single large episode. But when it came over to the states, I think they divided them. And so on my old DVD version, it's uh, this would be episode three, but it, it's technically episode two. Um, and so I guess the the breakdown of the plot. This one's fairly simple. Uh, Tiberius has been banished to Rhodes, and a lot of what is going on is Livia's efforts to bring Tiberius back to Rome. And Augustus mm -hmm. is very set against it. And so essentially what she's trying to do is prove to Augustus that the reason Tiberius misbehaved so much and the reason he hit Julia was because Julia was doing so many bad, scandalous things. And yeah. and so she she recruits one of uh, Julia's son is Lucius. Uh, if we remember from the the previous episode that uh, Gaius and Lucius were the two potential heirs. And at the start of this episode, Gaius is de uh, dies. We we assume Livia had a hand, but I don't think <laughs> they get into too much detail there. And and Lucius is sort of grown up. And uh, Livia recruits Lucius's friend. Uh, uh, I think Plautius was his name. Um, yes, Plautius. Yep. Uh, she recruits Plautius to. Um, to spy on Julia's mother because she knows that Plautius is having an affair with Julia. And Plautius composes a list of names, and she's able to bring a whole group of men before Augustus who have slept with his daughter, and there's a big scene about it, and Julia is eventually banished to, to an island. Uh, Augustus doesn't even want to know where, and they bring Tiberius back to Rome. Uh, there, there's some other things in here, too. There's also a scene that's pretty important where Claudius... Uh, is with his mother and Julia and some of the other children and a, a hawk I believe attacks a wolf cub and drops it from the sky and it lands in Claudius's arms and there's a, uh, a seer who just happens to be there who is able to read the sign of what it means and it essentially means that Rome will fall into a wretched state and Claudius will protect it somehow um, and there's yeah, also a lot Honestly, say, and that's actually the we don't even have Claudius introduced before he catches the cub. It's like yeah. the first time we he's kind of caught attention called to him is him catching the cub. So it's a it's a very dramatic introduction for him. And there's a lot of um, foreshadowing in this scene. Um, yeah, you know, there's there's a scene, and again, I'm going to spoil some things, but Lavilla, his sister, uh, takes issue with. Um, with, with with the reading because she you know she says a, you know oh uh uh you know Claudius is gonna is gonna is gonna rule Rome I hope I'm dead by then and then the uh or I hope I'm dead before then and then Antonia uh, her mother you know says go to your room you won't have any supper and and the, and and again I'm spoiling a very big plot point but that's how Lavilla dies the Antonia locks her in a room and doesn't feed her and, and that's what ends up killing her so it's it's a it's it, I I mean for I don't normally care that much about foreshadowing but I think this was like a really that was very re, yeah big. yeah very skillful use well, of foreshadowing it was good too I mean it's it's also it, it's good foreshadowing and it's good behavior in the moment too because Antonia is a very traditional person and for her yeah. for her daughter to say something flip in this divine moment of revelation where an oath was sworn to the gods it's like that would that is exactly the kind of thing that would infuriate her so it's 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 not it's not something that came off as oh that's that's the you know sometimes when you do foreshadowing like that it comes off as a little forced but this this didn't come off as forced it was natural and great foreshadowing at the same time yeah and the, and the uh and i think the seer was uh nias Demetius was the name of the seer uh and he's kind of a, um, I don't know, it, it, it was a very, I, I think that's a, a really good scene. Um, it's it's and, an amazing scene. Yeah. I mean, everything, everything that will happen in this episode is set up yeah. in this fairly long, leisurely scene of kind of characters coming and going. And it, it just sets the ball rolling for the whole episode. And another thing I like about it, and it's also one of the reasons why I like the scenes with um, 
uh, Tiberius and Thrasyllus on the uh, on, on the island of Rhodes, where uh, where mm. Thrasyllus is, uh, is is doing the horoscope charts for Tiberius, and 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 Tiberius gets so fed up, he starts reading Thrasyllus's horoscope yes. <laughs> uh, because he decided that if there's no good news, he's going to throw Thrasyllus off the side of the cliff. So he's looking at his horoscope to see if if he's in any if there are any bad signs to to help him sort of narrow down what's going to happen. Um, yeah. But I like that the show sort of assumes that the beliefs of the Romans are kind of real to a degree. Now, sometimes they're played yes. off as not like sometimes there's sort of a there's a skepticism about them. But like in the scene with the wolf, that felt like that was actually a sign. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like that was a, it, it, I mean, it's a very unusual thing to have happen. Um, <laughs> and, and everything sort and everything in that scene ends up playing out. So, uh, I, 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 I think, uh, you know, and, and the same, and, and similarly with a lot of the, the horoscope reading and, and I think that makes it more interesting because obviously, you know, it's, 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 it's not how, it's not how it would normally be done. Normally in a no. historical drama, what the Romans believe isn't going to be true. You don't, you don't, you don't take that step. You take a more historical skeptical approach. Um, no. You might have the There's Romans. There's definitely be- an element of magical realism to the show. Or they just, it's, it's, you know, and obviously there are people that are hucksters. I mean, the, the Tiberius's fortune teller yeah. is, clearly not on the level but so it's it, there's there's a nice balance of the two things and 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 it, and it works well in this show because the other the show is otherwise so rooted in reality it's so like you know it's all about like you know po- like really realistic political maneuvering interpersonal drama and you know there's not there really aren't like action sequences or anything crazy in the show like that and so mm-hmm. when you get these moments where it looks like there's a little bit of magic it just for, it just really works. Um, yeah. Now that and, that scene with him with that, with Claudius catching the cup is is it's it's a very dramatic scene, even though there isn't a lot of action to it. It really works. But you know, this thing on the topic of magic too in the show, it's it's interesting. You know, going back to Tiberius, uh, astrologer or horoscope guy or whatever his technical term would be. But uh, I I liked. Uh, I like the fact that early on his reading is totally accurate. It's like, oh, things are good. Things are going to happen for you. But, you know, because Tiberius doesn't have enough confidence and the guy clearly doesn't have enough confidence himself, he keeps making up lies like the eagle on the roof and stuff. So it's like it almost is like, yeah, what you are doing really works because it is this long time forecast. He He's 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 got an element of talent reading horoscopes, but he he needs to embellish and, and make these lies on top. I, I do have to say the guy who plays Thrasyllus of Mendes is really he was a really good choice for that role. <laughs> I think his name is um, Kevin Stoney. He uh, I don't know. And again, it, it kind of gets into the thing where, you know, when you have characters that are Egyptian or Greek or whatever, they always have these accents and all the Romans just talk like regular English yes. people. Yes. Um, and 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 I and I, I and and with his character, I really am wondering. I was I was trying to pay attention this time and see how much of what he's doing is legitimately panning out, and how much of it is hucksterism. And he's a very confusing blend of both. And I uh-huh. think it's because of, you know, he's dealing with Tiberius, who is very moody. I think we see a lot of interesting yes. character sort of shifts in this episode. You see Tiberius becoming more like the Tiberius that we're familiar with. Um, you know, he sort of, mm-hmm. he sort of, you know, in the previous episodes, even though he was dark, there was still, uh, there was still some goodness in the character. There was you, you felt know, for the guy, yeah, yeah. You felt for the guy, and you could see him if, if like he saw somebody hurt on the side of the road, he might help them. Do you know what I mean? He might not know yeah. why he's helping them, yeah. but he might help them. And 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 now you know he's he seems just as likely to kick them. Uh, you know, and yeah, and, well, I mean, obviously. Him, him blaming this guy doing his horoscope. It's like, you know, what if, if the guy was on it, I mean, the guy, the guy's stuck in this position of having to lie all the time because it's like, hey, maybe your horoscope is just bad. I, yeah. if you want an accurate reading, I can't promise you. I'm not moving the stars around in the sky here. You know, it's uh, he's, being, he's Tiberius is being completely, completely irrational in uh, giving the guy a hard time. But 
But it also makes sense for his character because he is kind of portrayed yeah. here as, as sort of a military guy who just kind of wants to get things done and he's stuck on this little island. And, <laughs> you know, and, and so, and he's obviously going to make it happen. Here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the other thing that we saw that was interesting is uh, we see Antonia's uh, lack of affection for Claudius for the first mm-hmm. time. I mean, we kind of got a hint of it, uh, you know, in the scene when, uh, when Drusus dies before she brings him to him but she mentioned she has a hard time being affectionate towards him and and it was interesting because she even makes the argument that the viewer immediately leaps to uh which is you know i realize i should be more affectionate because of his afflictions but i just can't and it and it's a very interesting character flaw because i feel like her character flaw is kind of the thing in the show that molds claudius into the more virtuous person that he becomes like you know mm-hmm. just just by comparison to the because everybody else i think maybe suffers from being spoiled and various other uh other things that allow their worst natures to really rise to the surface and, and in an odd way because claudius has this this distant mother who doesn't really give him a lot of affection and doesn't and doesn't and doesn't indulge uh he he sort of has to work harder uh, and it, it's, it's, I don't know. It's just a very, uh, yeah, that actually putting it another way too. It's like, who has been the other son that whose mother didn't particularly care for in the series so far was, uh, Drusus. <laughs> that's, was, true. Uh, that's true. Who, yeah, that's true. That's a good point. He was a fairly virtuous moral person. Yeah. So we've, we've, we've got a recurring, recurring theme going on with that. And, and, and so, yeah, so I, I think, I think, you know, the, it, I, I find their relationship very fascinating, um, which we'll get into as, as it plays out more. But we see sort of the seeds of it here, and I think that's a really good point about Drusus because I hadn't, I hadn't even made that connection. But now that you're talking about it, it's 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 obvious. It's it's a it's, yeah. It's, I, I, I it's occurred to me in the moment right yeah. now, but I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, well, it's it's interesting with Antonia too, because once again, she is a very traditional person too. So I think I think it would be especially you know to julia who is just kind of she doesn't care about tradition at all she's like oh he's you know i think he's kind of sweet and it's like whereas to antonio i feel like to her having a son who wasn't a ideal version of a roman i think i think on some level it would offend her (laughs) just based on things she said well, it was. It's also you're also getting a really good sense of other people's reaction to him. Like, like, like. There's that scene where Augustus. I think he's with the Equestrian Order. I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm pretty sure that's what they said in that scene that he was he was reprimanding the Equestrian uh, representatives uh, yeah. about his, uh, his his marriage laws that he was trying to enact. And yeah, and uh, and he and, and Claudius is in the garden and he grabs him because he needs like a child so he can say you know this is a you know a, a product of a good roman union and and claudius is twitching and stammering and and and, and it's, it's it's a really well done scene but you see that augustus doesn't harbor any ill will towards claudius he's generally sympathetic to him but yeah. but livia you know livia says, oh go yeah. ahead oh no you, you, you finish i'm sorry uh, she's you know she so he's walking claudius uh back to his lessons and livia passes by and she, you, you can just, she's just bristling the moment she sees him. And then when he leaves, she says that child should have been exposed at birth, which is a rolling yes. practice. And, uh, and, and, and Augustus is like, oh, we don't do that anymore. And, and so, but then that immediate, they immediately transition to the discussion of marriage. And it's interesting. We're seeing, you know, a lot of this episode is just Livia laying the groundwork for the things that she's trying mm-hmm. to do. And one of them is she's trying to set up the marriages of various people, all with her own interest in mind in the end. Um, yeah. And I think the big thing that she wants to do is uh, have uh, Lavilla and Castor married. Um, they also establish that Abri- Abri- uh, Agrippina and Germanicus will marry. And the question of who will Claudius marry comes up in that mm-hmm. scene. And also uh, Antonia also re- raises the issue. Um, and we do yeah. get an answer to that uh, next episode, I believe, or in an upcoming episode. Before we move on to from the scene with with, you know, with Augustus talking about his 
you know, marriage and the importance of stuff. And of course, that scene also is key because it's setting up the fact of just how humiliating the revelation of Julia is and that he's been yes. his big thing is the sanctity of marriage. People need to marry. People need to, you know, and so it's. You know that that just puts it in context. It's not just his personal honor as much as what what his political agenda has been. It's been a complete violation of it. And and yeah, and so and 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 to get to that, Livia manages to secure this list from Plautius, and and once she has the list, she she uses a trick on Lucius, can you know basically saying like you know you because she knows that he knew about it, uh, and he had assumed that Augustus knew about it. But, you know, clearly Augustus didn't. And she says, now it's too late. I can't save either of you. And so she persuades him to take the list to Augustus himself. Mm-hmm. And, and this is the thing, you know, and she explains that if she brought it, when she's talking to Plotius, not when she's talking to Lucius, that if she brought it, he'd question her motivations. But, be, but by, by putting it in the hands of Lucius, <laughs> she, she, she gives it to a reliable source who, uh, and then the next scene is him, sort of they bring all these senators and men before him who slept with his daughter and and again these scenes do not i mean by our standards they're pretty tame but 70s pbs and bbc they're a little bit you know a little bit risque the scenes with julia and all of her suitors and you know uh you know there's definitely there's nudity involved and um uh and so they're brought before him and he just kind of one by one, you know, says, have you slept with my daughter? And they and and some and, and the responses are all interesting. Most people sort of reluctantly say yes. Um, some people are just totally silent. And he comes to one guy and he says, have you slept with my daughter? He says, not slept, Caesar. Uh, and, not slept. Yeah, yeah. I, I had that. Bur- that was one of those lines burned in my brain yeah. with his response of not slept. I, I just I knew that line yeah. for that, it, like, perfectly. It just delivered I, so perfectly. And I, I had the same feeling because I, I was just waiting for that to sort of, you know, crop out. I couldn't remember exactly which beat it was on, like which guy. I knew it was uh, like, you know, a couple in, three in. But what I always wonder is like, what was that guy? Like, what does he think saying that is going to achieve? Like, like, he, I know, like, I know. like, oh, you didn't sleep with her. Oh, okay, that changes everything. Um, yeah, the guy, the guy that the guy earlier in the line that's like well, only once. Yeah. It's like, oh well, oh, you had no affection for my daughter. That's yeah. that's good to know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there, there's really nothing you can say in that scene to minimize uh, the consequences. I think. Um, no, I, th- I think just saying yes and and that's it is your absolute yeah. best bet. <laughs> and it's it's also one of the few scenes. And Brian Blessed talks about this in the commentary on the Acorn DVD. But it's one of the few scenes where you really see Augustus as ruler of Rome, not as just some guy being yes. being misled by people in his court, uh, trying. You know, he, he, he you you clearly see the the Roman soldiers behind him. You 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 have this these row the row of people whose faces you never see you just see them from the back and he's just walking in front of them in a line, and and he's also seems dressed up a little bit more in this scene, um, and so it's it's striking when you get to it because in all because in all the other scenes leading up you know he's like he's he's like eating watermelon or just sort of like you know wearing a funny hat and sitting in his garden and you know talking about the importance of some eccentric thing that he's taken an interest in. Um, so so it it really sort of stands out. Um I think uh uh what was it? The uh the, the other thing I wanted to talk about which was really more about something that came up last episode but we forgot and I knew I, I knew we would both want to discuss it. Um yeah. is props, the use of props in the show. And in particular mm-hmm. in this in this episode the use of props was largely like the papyrus scrolls and you know letters that people are writing and uh, uh, which I always kind of find interesting, like the opening scene where L- Claudius is looking for the letter that Livia wrote to Tiberius. And number one, it establishes sort of he's kind of he's almost a little bit like a, it, it, you sort of see Claudius, the historian, trying to find his primary sources. And mm-hmm. and, uh, and and I just find those scenes charming. But in the previous episode, there was um, the game Empire that Gaius and Lucius were playing with Augustus, the uh, yeah. the board game. And yeah. And uh, number one, I just thought that looks like a really cool game. Uh, yeah, I, looked, yeah, I remember seeing as a kid watching that, like, ooh, wow, I want to play that. <laughs> and, you know, and 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 I, and I, I have a, I can't remember. I feel like somebody has 
made that a game at some I feel like I've seen that turned into a game somewhere but if not I think it would be a great it it just looks like it's kind of like it's almost a little bit like Rome as Monopoly is the way that it was presented (laughs) in the show because they're they're clearly rolling 2d6 I think and they're moving the pieces around and they're able when they land on a on a on a province they're able to do like I think they can it sounds like they have the option of taking the province and leaving troops behind and you know it's an interesting it's an interesting sort of game to to yeah. think about um but i'm really liking the props in the show i think the props are are really effective i think uh you know from the costumes to the uh, uh to the letters i was a little curious about some of the uh, the togas this episode I noticed like the 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 equestrians and the senators had diff- have different um, uh, different different purple bands on their on their clothing do you know what I mean like uh-huh. it indicates their rank and I was having trouble telling if they were using the right ones or not this episode I was trying to figure that out and it wasn't 100% clear to me but um, but they yeah. but they at least had the purple bands on them you know what I mean they have the <laughs> so yeah I, I that's outside my knowledge base entirely so i can't uh, comment well, on that well and also i mean in fairness this is what 1976 or something so yeah uh, 76 so i mean it's not like the internet was a thing it's like now it's very easy to get picky about well that's not the right uh you know uh you know the right stripe on the on the upper shoulder of the uniform because all I have to do is a Google image search and I know that you know you know World War Two soldiers had you know but like but yeah, in, well, in seventy six oh go ahead you actually just reminded me you know talking about that it's like my my mother uh, was a, was an actress in the theater and she studied kind of the British tradition of acting and and she I remember she had. A, an illustrated book that was a British theater book that was nothing but period costumes okay. throughout all of history and like what, you, what accurate costumes you, were. Can you find the name of that book by any chance or is it lost now to the... I, I'm sure she has it. Find uh, it out is the a, name. a prized possession. Because I have yeah. a feeling that book would be adored by gamers. That, that yeah. seems like the kind <laughs> of book that like I, like I know I would have a million uses for that. Uh, yeah, it's something I wished I've had. I've thought back on it when I was a kid. It was cool. Yeah. I, I said, you know, when I said it's outside my knowledge, I'd flip through this book, but I didn't really. It was just kind of like cool looking at the cool pictures. But I'm like, it's one of I at times wish, man, I wish I had this in my collection of role playing game books. <laughs> but but I guess the point is, before the internet, I mean, really, it was, it was it was a lot harder to 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 sort of vet all that stuff because. Yeah, you were lucky sometimes to even have a source, and if you had a source, you you know you don't know sources could vary, um, so you couldn't go and look up like a you know a hundred different images and compare them all side by side, and it was just a you know yeah. and it was well, less exactly. instantaneous. And even this book, I'm sure it's got stuff on like you know a proper Roman toga and stuff, but I don't know I don't know that it would be so specific that it would get into. And this is what these yeah. particular people had. I it, I, I forget. There's a the there's a great book. I don't I don't have it on hand, so I can't remember the full title. But it's a sort of a picture history book of I think it's called Rome and Athens, and mm-hmm. I think it's one book. It might be two separate books. I can't remember. But but either way, it's like a a tour of all of Rome. It's like a visual guide, and it gives you like all of the all of the attire, all of the clothing, all of the hairstyling, right down to like what they use to go to the bathroom and, and wipe with. And like like all the little details of daily life in Rome, um, yeah. And it, 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 for years, I think it, it was it was like my go to source for those kinds of details for gaming purposes. Um, you know, I I, I, I I'm going to try to remind me at the end of the episode to to find the name of it, and I'll put a link for people because I think that's a book that cool. I would recommend if, if, if I could get if I could remember the title, which my memory is not what it was before. That's that's probably the, if you could only get one book as sort of like a guide for Roman and Greek sort of, you know, details like that, that would be the book I would, I would recommend to people. Um, but, but the one that your mother has, I'd really like to, to find out about. Um, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll find out the details. Maybe we can link that in the next episode. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, I'm trying to think of what else was, uh, was going Did we cover every, every event in the episode. I feel like, I guess there's the whole issue of Julia's exile and the scene yeah. where she's uh, locked in her room, 
or not, or, or Augustus, no. I think, has locked himself in he's, his own he's room. He's locked himself yeah. in, yeah. And he, and and she's beating on the door, and he's he's like covering his ears and not listening. And and there's this great scene where she crouches on the ground, and you don't even see Livia, she, but you can tell that she's talking to Livia because Livia is sort of like behind the camera, and she eventually walks up, and you see her, but she confronts her, and she sort of unleashes all of her venom at Livia, mm. and. And you can just tell in that scene that she's completely lost the battle because she yeah. she 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 lays all of her cards on the table. And Livia, I don't think Livia says anything. Um, no, she's won already. Yeah. So. <laughs> but I, but I just find that scene so interesting because she's sort of like I you know you're I know what you're doing. You're trying to lay the groundwork for Tiberius to rule, but I have two sons, and you know it's just this, and it's like well, yeah. not for long. Uh, and, and yeah. And, and uh, but but the fact that Livia says nothing, I think, is uh, is pretty significant there. Um, but yeah, I think I think one thing to bring up too with this episode is it would have. I think it did a great job of keeping Livia's plotting with the murders in the background. You know, it's yeah. like it's implied she's doing it because it. You know, last episode we did have a lot of the nuts and bolts of her poisoning people and seeing her doing stuff. Yeah. And that would have gotten really repetitious if, if every one of these deaths we had to see Olivia going about it. It's just it, it, it was it was a very smart choice to just background all of that. Well, it's good, too, because it makes you sort of see it through the eyes of the characters who are worried about being harmed by her. And, yeah. and it leaves <laughs> question marks around a lot of the deaths. Like, yeah, like you don't know for sure that she, you know, what her hand in Lucius was. You're pretty sure, but you don't know for for certain. And. And and there's enough wiggle room for the deniability there, and 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 I think it's even more the case with somebody like Drusus, where we find out more about what actually happens with Drusus later. But initially, you're led to believe that Livia had a hand in Drusus's death, and mm -hmm. but it's kind of unclear. And then later on, there's some clarification that kind of that exploits the murkiness of yeah. of what you're talking about, how it's all kind of off camera, and so. I mean, you know, so when you get to the, you know, and we kind of glossed over it, but Lucius ends up getting, uh, dying in a, in a boating accident. And, uh, See, that one, I thought Lucius' death was pretty clear. Having, having, I mean, I don't know. Actually, I guess now I say it out loud. It, it isn't as clear. I'm saying, yeah, yeah, but Plautius was there. We know she was plotting with him. But then again, Plautius was always with Lucius. Yeah. So it, that, that does leave some ambiguity. Well, but. well, and I think we both know she, she had a hand in it. Like, it's obvious in the way it's yeah. done, but you don't yeah. see it. And so there is that little sliver of maybe no. not. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe there's enough, maybe not there. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of that in this show. There's a lot of stuff that happens off camera and there's a, there's an obvious conclusion you can draw, but there's, there's usually just a little enough room for doubt that, mm -hmm. well, like, okay. Like in the seat there's, because all we get is it, there's, there's one scene where she's talking to Plautius and she's saying, so you're willing to betray your friend's mother. That's good. What about your friend? And he kind of looks down. And then a moment later she says, I may have another task for you, but it's not going to be nearly as yeah. pleasant. And at yeah. first they play it like she's asking for a sexual favor and you're almost led to assume that. But then when Lucius dies, I think you're supposed to make the connection. No, she was talking about him having to murder his friend Lucius. Um, but again, there's still enough doubt that, you know, uh, yeah, like I said, I, I, it was clear to me watching the show that, that Livia was behind it and had Plautius do it. But, but when I say it out loud, I'm like, well, there's no evidence there at all. Plautius was there. He must've done it. Yeah. But yeah. He was always with Lucius. What are you saying? And, and, and I'm like, always, oh, that, and, it sounds and, like nonsense when you say it out loud. And, and I guess, I guess the question is how much, how much of a lever does Livia even have to pull to have her, you know, like, like, like she almost, you could almost say Plautius acted on his own desire because sure. she never, she, she never explicitly told him, at least in the scenes we saw there might well, have been a scene yeah. that happened, but I'm sure, but, but, but maybe not, maybe that conversation was sufficient. It could have been, yeah, it you know could have I mean? been. And, yeah. and, and if that's yeah. the case, it's almost like she's, she's so, she's so good at this. She, she, she doesn't even have to like if that's all she had to do to get Pl Lucius killed, she can almost she can almost wipe the guilt from her mind by the fact that <laughs> do you know what I mean? It, it, it's almost like she could believe herself that she wasn't responsible if she really wanted to. Um, uh -huh. uh, so it's just that devious. Um, 
But I don't know. There, there, again, there could be like a scene that we're, we're obviously supposed to assume happened, but we didn't see, you know, the, the, where she lays it out. But I feel like Livia is is the kind of person who sort of she's she's been doing this so long. She can just kind of nudge a person in the right direction and they'll go there without yeah. really giving them explicit instructions. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah. So, uh, again, I think um, and again, we, we are sort of getting to a point where where Lin, where Livia is sort of. Uh, she's she's at her prime, but her and Augustus are both now clearly aging, and so it's kind of interesting to see that that side of it too. What did you think of the makeup? How did you feel about the aging makeup? Ah, uh, it's serviceable. I mean, it's it's the it's the kind of makeup that would be very effective on stage. Yeah, but uh, but you could see the seams. But I don't know. I mean, I, I you know you could see the flaws here and there. It wasn't terrible though. I mean, I've seen much much worse aging makeup in Hollywood movies. But, uh, I, well, but, the one that stuck out for me was the jowl. The jowl on Augustus's jaw really looked like it was just plopped there with some putty. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that one kind of stuck out. But yeah, I mean, it, again, this is the kind of show where you can, like, like Adam said, you can see the seams, so you kind of have to you kind of have to use your imagination with some of the makeup a little bit, I think, in, mm-hmm. in a series like this. But, but the acting will kind of d- a lot, you know, enable that for you. Um, yeah. I mean, other thing to consider too is that, you know, back in 1976, people were watching this on cathode ray TV screens yeah. too. It's like, this would not have looked nearly as clear. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure the makeup looked an awful lot better if you were watching it on yeah. a, with, watching it on a rabbit ear cathode ray TV screen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even when I watched it in the nineties, I was watching it on like one of those old tube TVs that, you know, Oh yeah, you know, of course. Nineties was, was still tube TVs. Yeah, so. so, and I don't, and I don't remember noticing the makeup quite as much on that because it was the kind of TV where you could see the screen. Do you know I mean you had like the screen, the, the grid on the TV that you could see? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, but, but, but this version, it, it's still, lo- I mean, it's grainy. Like if you watch I Claudius, even on like the acorn DVD or, on the Amazon, which I think they use the Acorn version, um, mm-hmm. you know, they, there was only so much they could do to, 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 and they probably wouldn't want to HDify a show like this. I don't think I, no, I think it would damage it. Terrible error, terrible yeah. error to make it make it clear. Because yeah, I mean, I mean, like the props are well done, the costumes are well done, but you know, it, it is just something shot on TV studio sets, so. If you if you made it too if even if you could make it crisper it wouldn't be a good idea. So there there there, uh, there are a few quotes I did want to uh, mention here. Um, uh, there, there's a great one by Augustus. He has all these little sayings like the boiled asparagus <laughs> one, and this one we hear is a radish may know no Greek but I do, um, <laughs> which you know he just got these very eccentric little sayings. And there's also the line that uh, Livia delivers to Plautius where she sort of. Uh, and, and it's interesting because as the scene progresses, he he sort of realizes just how deeply in trouble he might potentially be here with this woman. Um, and she's sort of being pleasant, and then she looks at him and she says, "Does Lucius know you're plowing his mother's furrows with such ferocious skill and energy?" And that line is always yeah. stuck in my head. Um, <laughs> you know, it, 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 but the, I always thought that was a very very skillful piece of writing in the show. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit over the top, but it's witty and humorous. And, um, mm-hmm. uh, but something in the, in the show that we don't see, and I can't, I, I haven't read the book since about 2012, so it's been a little while. But if I recall, the whole thing with Julia having all of these affairs and all this stuff, I'm pretty sure it's because Livia was poisoning her. I think, I think in the book, Livia was giving her something that was causing her hair to fall out and also making her, uh, that was acting as a really powerful aphrodisiac. Huh. Um, I could be wrong, but I'm like 90 percent certain of that, uh, that, 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 that that's a plot point in the book. Um, and they don't I don't think they address it at all in the show. Um, and it's kind of it, it probably would lessen the I, I think they maybe went the right way in the show by not having that. Yeah, book. I think it's better to not have that. I mean, it's also kind of a weird thing with Julia being the one that's most seems very aware of Livia's poisonings it would be it would seem at least how like I said based on how she's portrayed in the show it wouldn't make sense for her to leave herself that open to uh, Livia's poisoning you'd think she'd be the one 
<laughs> who'd be most certain that she wasn't though, drinking or eating anything that passed through. Though, but, uh, as we discover, it is really hard to avoid Livia's. That's touch. true. The, uh, that's true. So, like yeah. later in the show, and I'm going to spoil a big plot point. Augustus eventually realizes that Livia is a poisoner, and he stops. He he doesn't he doesn't like accuse her, you know, point blank. But he realizes what's going on with her, and and so he starts only eating figs from his garden that he's plucked oh, yeah. by his own hand. And she ends yeah. up going in there and painting the poison onto the fig tree. Uh, so I mean, there's like if you're oh, yeah, that, and I and I got to sit here quickly. It's just that it, you reminded me too that there is the line in the show in the first scene with Antonia and Julia. You know, and, you know, Julia's admits, oh yeah, I don't hire my slaves anymore. Which means it would be really easy for Julia to get, I not for Julia, for uh, Livia to get a poisoner yeah. in her household because she's not, she's not even paying. She, they're, they're, she's talking freely about Livia poisoning people in front of people that she didn't even hand pick. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's like Livia's probably got her house full of spies. We kind of we had a somewhat similar conversation before the podcast, but like we don't think of poisoning it's not it's not like we don't we don't live in daily fear of being poisoned it's not something that if you yeah. live in you know because it doesn't happen that much anymore because of forensics and things like that but like yeah. if you were if you're living in this environment with Livia in the household i i i don't know like how can you you can't protect yourself at all times against there are so many ways that a poisoner can get to you um yeah yeah, it, it there's would, a good line. There was a good line last episode with with you know the old Claudius that we see, you know, where he's talking about nothing. Nothing tastes right when you know people are trying to poison you. Yeah. He just he just he just can't enjoy food at all. <laughs> and 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 in fact, and again, I'm going to spoil a big plot point. But if I recall, at the the final scene, not the final scene, but the final moments of the show where he gets poisoned by his wife, he almost mm. knowingly bites the poison food, you know. And you, yeah. you get the feeling that maybe, it, well, in part because he's reached this really elaborate conclusion about what needs to happen that we'll get into when we get there. But also there must be a certain amount of relief of knowing I'm con like, OK, I know that's poison and I'm just going to choose to to <laughs> eat it. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to remove all doubt and and just and just like dive into it. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, I, I, they do a really good job in the show, sort of getting you to feel the paranoia of the characters around the around the poisoning. Um, mm -hmm. and, and again, we see it with like there's that line where Julia is talking to Antonia again, and she says, you know, she says like, you know, well, he, you know, a lot of people say he he went he was happy to go to Rhodes because he could get it away from me, but there's also you know the possibility that. He, he, he really is happy because he got away from his mother because she used to invite him to dinner too often. And I saw the look on his face whenever she served him yes. wine. You know, like, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Another, like the, that, that first scene has so much stuff in it. It's, uh, it's, it's for, I mean, I, I know once again, we've, comparing this to a lot of shows now, I, I complain about it in a lot of modern shows how if they're doing, you know, a season long story. They don't do a good job of making each episode stand alone alone. It's like this episode is very well structured. I mean, it just, it just, I, you know, we, we debated whether to do multiple episodes in a podcast or one episode. And it's like, I'm very glad we came down on the side of doing one episode yeah. because it, it's letting me, letting me savor the structure of each episode. And, and uh, and oh, and we, we'd be remiss if we forgot about this detail. Herod Agrippa makes an appearance. Yes, as a child. yes. Um, and I should say, all of them, like a lot of the main characters, are being introduced as children here. So we see Posthumus as a child. We see Claudius as a child. We see Lavilla as a child. We see Agrippina as a child. And we see Germanicus. And Herod is introduced by Claudius to his mother Antonia and Julia. And he's this mm -hmm. very, just very <laughs> smooth you know polite child and when you and and we have foreknowledge of the character that he becomes but he's he's really like he's one of the best characters in the show he's uh mm -hmm. hands down one of the most enjoyable characters and uh and and uh and and it's also interesting because like, i mean again they're all historical figures but you're so used to all, you're so used to augustus and claudius and livia at this point you almost forget that they're historic that these are like historical figures stepping out of history but then when herod yeah. shows up you're like oh wait uh another historical figure has showed up and uh, yeah <laughs> and, uh, and is and, and again this kind of gets into the stuff we were talking about i think we were 
discussing this with Return of Condor Heroes, where the way that like Genghis Khan was was uh, was utilized as a character, and I feel mm-hmm. like this show is very similar to 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 that show in that and that story where just the way that they use historical characters they treat them as real characters they don't like like they draw on the history for sure but they inject them with a life that is almost it's it's almost like a little bit um it's 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 a little bit in to a degree you could say it's a little bit disrespectful in that they're not sort of holding them up as these iconic things that we have to uh you know they're not putting anybody up on a pedestal but they're they're giving them enough human qualities that we can recognize and qualities they might not have actually possessed but yeah. things that make them recognizable to us as people that bring them to life as characters I, th- I think that really is a again we're gamers i think that's like a really good lesson for people that are doing historical games and stuff you know yes. to, to be willing yeah. to do that to put you like your I, I guess the way i would put it is it's like the writer is putting his own spin on these people. The spin is mm-hmm. definitely based on what the person has read about the figure, but it's the writer's own spin. And and that's yeah. the sort of magic that makes them work. Yeah, no, they they've got a concept as characters. But uh yeah, I mean it, I mean there's a lot it's it's I think the show does a pretty good job with the child actors in this episode of uh because there's, there's a lot of children in this episode, yeah. but it does it does a good job of, of giving them just enough dialogue to be in the episode, but not putting them out there where where yeah. you have to deal deal with uh you know child too much child acting. It well, does it, it keeps it keeps the, it keeps the focus on the adult characters as far as most of the heavy lifting goes. Well, in fact, there's even one scene. I think it was an I think it was a mistake. There's a scene where Germanicus is talking to Antonia. And I think she's telling him not to be as rough with the girls or something. And yeah. He he seems to stumble over the line a little bit. And yeah. There's and I don't. It, it could have been planned. Maybe that's how it was supposed to go down. But to me, it always sounds like an accident. And then you see that the woman playing Antonia has this look in her. She sort of her eyes like latch onto his. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And like it seems to carry him through the scene, and it actually makes the scene even <laughs> better. Um, it's like a little, weird little detail that. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that, uh, that's, that's that, interesting. But it adds to her character because it shows you her power as a character. Like she, <laughs> she's not powerful like Livy is powerful, but she's like she's powerful to the people who respect her. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, and, yeah, definitely. And she's and she's the character like when you're watching the show, she's the character that you would want to have to be. You'd like want to be get into her good graces. Do you know what I mean? Like that's just the natural feeling that you tend to have towards Antonia. Um, yeah, I, I, well, the relationship between Julia and Antonia is interesting because they're utterly, utterly different people. But yeah. you feel like, like Julia, Julia has kind of this begrudging admiration that you know it's like the, to, for Antonia there that uh, that uh, gives you know, like I said, she never really, never really listens to anything Antonia says. But you know, she uh, she, she does 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 admire it to some level. And. Uh... And yeah, so I don't know. Is there any, I, we we're already on forty minutes here, so we should probably uh, call it a day. But is there anything you want to add about the episode before we go into the next one next week? Uh, no, I pretty much covered all my uh, all my uh, topics that I had on hand. <laughs> okay, and so yeah, I, I don't think I have anything to add. I think it was a good idea to do one episode because I think there was a lot to go over, and it's 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 a, and also it was very focused because there was a lot, but it was all. Set, it was all organized around, you know, this 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 plot point about Tiberius and Julia, and you know there were yeah. other things, but that was really kind of the heart of the episode. And yeah, uh, of course, I, I, well, actually, I will add one thing: the the final scene too of the uh, of, of of jumping to to Claudius at the uh, same fountain where mm-hmm. the the scene with the children is going on is uh, that that's just that's just a great great ending to the episode that that was a, that's a really memorable scene too because that's a scene where uh posthumus finds out that he's been adopted by augustus he's basically his yeah aunt, and he's really really depressed and he's only a child so like he he clearly knows more about what's going on than and the than child should have yeah. to <laughs> and, uh, 
And so Herod asks him, like, why are you so sad? He, you know, it's, it's an honor to be his heir. And he says, yeah, but my uncle Tiberius is also uh, his heir. And we both can't be, you know, like, he, he can do the math. And, uh, and so he pretty much knows that he's doomed. And, uh, and, and, and it's, it's a chilling scene. And, and again, we'll get, we'll, you know, we'll get to what happens. Uh, uh, but, but obviously, you know, you know, people know who becomes emperor. Um, yeah, so, exactly. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's, I think that, and I, and I think the transition of having Claudius sort of, you know, uh, the, the, the other thing I like about that scene is it shows you how much more, well, I guess, I guess at the end, Augustus's reign is somewhat lonely, lonely too. But Claudius's reign is particularly lonely compared to yes. Augustus's. Augustus it sets up the loneliness of the character very yeah. much. Yeah, because Augustus, he is surrounded by family. There's a sense of all the and, and over the course of the show, I mean, they do introduce new characters. Like we, we'll, we'll get introduced to Caligula soon enough, and other <laughs> other people will be introduced. But most of what's going on is the characters are getting whittled away. The people that are dear to Claudius uh, evaporate over time. And, and and the people that replace them, that the, the new characters that he's surrounded by, are usually not very trustworthy people, and they're not mm-hmm. people that he has the same kind of relationship with. So by the end, it's a fairly lonely world that he lives in. Um, and I and I think, like you said, like that transition really hammers home exactly where the show is going, um, yeah. and the contrast between that and Augustus's reign couldn't be more clear. Um, so yeah, so the next episode is actually what shall we do about Claudius? So it is the huh. uh, the marriage episode. I gotta say, in the book, they re- the book really dives deeply into Claudius's marriage. Um, this only touches on it, but it's but it's a very accurate. Gl- you you can extrapolate a lot from from the little that we see. Uh, uh, and, uh, but but I think one of the one of the one of the one of the joys of reading the book is getting. The, the the plot details on that um but yeah so but we'll get into that next episode and uh, and i think that's around uh, uh i'm going by the wikipedia entry but it looks like that's set around 9 ad so uh so we're kind of slowly working our way up we you know uh it, it, it's very interesting to see the characters age as this happens and uh and and also you know you know, I mean, I, you know, obviously, if you're if you if you grew up going to church and stuff, it's kind of always cool to to sort of try to think of where this falls in the gospels. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's something I always find myself doing. Um, but uh, but anyways, uh, I think we'll uh, we'll head out, and I don't know we'll probably be back either on Wednesday. If you know, sometimes we have to skip longer depending on our schedules, but we try to usually do these what Sunday and Wednesday, or those are our standard yeah. days. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I want to apologize to people. I'm in a different location than normal. We had plumbing issues. I probably mentioned this a few times already. And there may be sounds in the background that are a little beyond my control because I'm staying at relatives' houses and I can only manage the background noise so much. So until I'm back in my apartment, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a it's gonna be a more festive atmosphere in the background. Um, <laughs> so all right, so we'll let you go. And until then, we'll talk to you later. Bye.